I talked about how my students had no dreams. I mean, what is there left to dream? When I was a kid, I dreamed about dinosaurs. I had a little Walt Disney dinosaur book. Why would I need to dream about dinosaurs now? Steven Spielberg has made them. He's filmed them. They're more real than real dinosaurs. They're hyper real. You would be disappointed if you saw a real Tyrannosaurus Rex after the movie. Sorry, I was just, uh, you know. Notice this, but I did a bit of foreshadowing in the beginning of the video because there's this one moment in Jurassic Park 3 where Sam Neill or Alan Grant is having a nap on a plane, a will baby plane, and to demonstrate that his obsession with raptors and the lingering trauma from the first movie is still taking over his life, when he wakes up from his nap, there's a talking raptor, and it says with a surprisingly pleasant voice, Alan, and it hits so hard. This, it's just, this makes me want to break off my shins and then use them as a ladder to throw myself into a volcano and then climb myself back up through my shin ladder and then throw myself back in with the velocity of a weighted Lego Ninjago. And what's even better is that it, it works. It's thematically relevant. It, it makes sense in the context of the story and the franchise as a whole. In my opinion, what makes Jurassic Park so special, on a, well, on a personal note, I just appreciate the, the, the driving centrifugal, centrifugal? The, the, the main driving plot force is not really romance, it's kind of tangential, it's off to the side. Because... No, you're not supposed to... I'm not supposed to know about you for like another two years or... or um, what do you think, future Maddie? Yeah, uh, probably about two more years. Does a uh, 20 sound good to you? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, can I ask about the... the... the, the beard? Time travel stuff. Okay. Good. Makes sense. In addition, it also, in a very Spielbergian fashion, makes the wonder of childhood breathtakingly real. Seeing these two scientists who touch and watch and read alongside something that only existed as a sketched outline in their imagination just makes you want to giggle and then cry a little bit too. This is also worsened by the fact that loving dinosaurs is often a universal kid experience. First of all, dinosaurs are just sick as heck. I mean, look at this guy. This guy looks like he drinks black shots of espresso and then takes people who play TikToks out loud into the sun. And also there's just something romantic about dinosaurs and their fossils too. When you're a kid, it is more than a little comforting to know that regardless of who you are or when history leaves you behind, the earth remembers. No matter what, there is always going to be a whisper of you. you gotta push, Even after Jurassic Park turns our dreams into nightmares, our innocence dies, you can still find magic and mystery, the echo of a beautiful dinosaur and some cool birds. And Jurassic Park 3 takes this idea and makes a Dada-esque masterpiece. Because since Jurassic Park made Alan Grant's dreams a reality, it puts his reality, his dream reality, back into the realm of his dreams. And, and it's horrible. And it's so weird. And it's... I love it. So I know a lot of YouTube content has moved away from just thing bad, maybe a little bit too much. We're defending fan four stick now and... No. Stop. But hey, the internet clearly loves a hypocrite. So here I am, defending Jurassic Park 3, directed by Joe Johnston and executively produced by Steven Spielberg. Because, so, I don't know. Honestly, it's not funny at all. It's not but, very uh, good, but it helps me sleep, sleep at night. night.
Jurassic Park. This movie was huge. It came out in 1993 and became the first movie ever to make over 500 million in its opening weekend. It also made, you know, like 1.6 billion during its theatrical release. It was an adaptation of Michael Crichton's novel, who also co-wrote the script with David Capp. It follows Dr. Grant, Sam Neill, Ellie Slater, Laura Dern, and Ian Malcolm, Jeff Goldblum, who were invited by a Walt Disney S. John Hammond to give a scientific seal of approval on a park of genetically engineered dinosaurs. Dr. Grant is a dad, Laura Dern is girl, and Jeff Goldblum is beautiful. It became a kind of instant classic that inspired an odd for your filmmakers and paleontologists everywhere. But the sequels, well, they, they had a bit of a diminishing return problem. What's the diminishing return? Jurassic Park The Lost World, still directed by Steven Spielberg, had pretty bad pacing and character issues. Where the running away and into one set piece into the next works in Jurassic Park 1, here it gives off the rushed and stakeless vibe of Rise of Skywalker. It was described as self-reflexive and perfunctory and cynical and not in the fun way. I love Jeff Goldblum, and, and when he cried on RuPaul's Drag Race, I cried too. He's very charming and incredibly talented. However, I don't think his wink-wink, nudge-nudge sarcasm lends itself to Spielberg's typical brand of sentimental and idealistic heroes. The movie did more than okay in the box office. It made over $600 million, but critics and fans were not especially jubilant. Most egregiously, in my opinion, is that this movie gives off the vibe that Spielberg was frustrated and tired. Jurassic Park was essentially a sequel to Jaws, thematically and spiritually, so making a sequel to a sequel there really isn't much left to explore in the eyes of Spielberg, who practically made the same movie three times, just in different flavors. As a result, even the most grandiose moments of spectacle are undercut by the exhausted exile of a director who can't reconcile what and why he's making this movie. This proves to be a little problematic since Jurassic Park really relies on its spectacle to work. Now, I apologize for what I'm about to say because I'm playing into every video essay trope here. But you know how Hitchcock said that suspense is more about what you can't see than what you do? And tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. The bomb must never go off. Once we've seen the dinosaurs, a whole lot of that suspense just doesn't quite hit the same. We already know where the bomb is and exactly when it's going to go off. I mean, the T-Rex shows up exactly at the halfway point, one hour and four minutes in both films. While I do really enjoy Jurassic Park 2, I think it's fair to say that without the effective suspense or meaningful character drama, we are left with a thin, empty carcass of a movie without any meat or bones. That brings us to Jurassic Park 3. Now, I wasn't alive when this movie came out, but back in 2001, it looks like they didn't really like this movie. It still made a considerable amount of money, with by no means a flop, but it is still the lowest grossing Jurassic Park movie. It suffers from the same pacing and character problems, but honestly, at only 1 hour and 30 minutes, it feels more profoundly watchable than Jurassic Park 2. I don't know. I just think there's a lot to like about this movie. One, Alan Grant has a really nice character arc. I just want to say if you ever need help with anything, sometimes you forget to ask. So you can call me. The rubber! She said the Navy and Marines. God bless you, Ellie. Three, it's generally the most funny Jurassic Park movie. It's T Rex P. I got a buck. I got a buck ten. <laughs> Nobody move a muscle. Sadly, everything wasn't sunshine and daisies. GP3 had a famously troubled production. They shot without a script, and William H. Macy, while well, he didn't seem especially happy. Moreover, its creation, from my perspective, is one of the most cynical I've seen from Spielberg. This is a bit tin hatty, but the making of documentary opens with Spielberg introducing a new Jurassic Park themed attraction at Universal Studios theme park. That's pretty much his only appearance in any of the extras. Absence was also central to his conduct as an executive producer, as according to Johnston, Spielberg's chair was usually empty, and he wasn't quite sure whether Spielberg was just trying out a new hands-off approach or communicating a silent threat. Despite his physical absence, Jurassic Park 3 certainly feels like a Spielberg movie. I mean, Laura Dern is still girl and the BIPOC characters are immediately and brutally killed off. There's also the Room Room dinosaurs, the veggie dinosaurs, and the raptors. Most importantly, the underdeveloped side character gets to use their weird random skills that were set up in an innocuous scene earlier. This time, it's not coding or gymnastics. This guy just learned how to swim, baby. And boy, does he swim. How much weight did you say you lost? About 25 pounds. I've been swimming. Oh, and a 
of course, the helicopters. I know what you're thinking. My Australian accent is shockingly good. Jurassic Park. 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 Cleo. Emma. Condensation. And I suppose you're also wondering that if this movie follows Jurassic Park formula so closely, how in the heck is it any less bland or exhausting than the second one? Well, please pray for my health and safety because now I gotta talk about subverting expectations. Jurassic Park 3 goes something like this. Alvin Grant likes raptors a lot. He's also a lonely dinosaur man, and he has no money. The supposedly rich couple, Paul and Amanda Kirby, played by William H. Macy and Tasha Leone, give him money. Alan Grant goes to Dinosaur Island with the very 2000s looking dude, Billy Brennan. He accidentally steals some raptor eggs. Raptors hunt them. There is also a child. Then they escape on the helicopters. On the surface, this is an especially bland, annoying blockbuster. But I can't like something that's bad, so I'm gonna say it's an artful deconstruction of blockbuster filmmaking, Steven Spielberg, and the ethics of doing anything. It, uh, subverts your expectations. It turns to subversion in the opening minutes of the film. As we expect, Alan Grant is fulfilling his patriarchal role at the head of the family, and him and Laura Dern are having lots of kids. No? No? This is Alan. What about being invited to an island by a bunch of rich people? There's no such thing as Kirby Enterprises. It's Kirby Paint and Tile Plus. Uh, oh, does Alan Grant save any kids? Like, you know, grabbing, grabbing kids and shocking them with fences and stuff? <laughs> Kid saves him, okay. And uh, he's competent, confident, and not annoying. It's good. T-Rex at the one hour mark. <laughs> Oh my god, it's killed, and it's neck and snapped in 15 minutes. What about the raptors? They're clearly the big bads in this movie, right? Oh, there are parallels to the adult characters because they're also just looking for their kids. Nice, I'm glad we extended compassion to the raptors in this movie. Good, 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 good. Does anybody get punished for greed, child abandonment, or being a lawyer? I took them on an impulse. I thought they'd be worth a fortune enough. <laughs> So, what do we do? We search for your son in the direction that they're going. Oh no, the guy who stole for profit lives and Miss Drew Desky, who is perfectly adorable, dies. Noise. But helicopters? I still got helicopters and when Alan Grant looks at the window, he's gonna see regular old birds because he's embracing reality and abandoning... He's the dented little dinosaur. It's little... Dinosaur, it's the rumors. Whatever, because I still got. Alan. I know historically subverting expectations has not gone great for popular media. He needs some milk. On the other hand, when there is genuine purpose or thematic relevance for a piece of fiction to engage with the tropes of a genre, I think it can communicate the themes in a much more artful way. So now that picks the question, does Jurassic Park 3 do that? Does it engage with its tropes in a meaningful way? To answer that deeply relevant and impactful question, well, we first gotta talk about Steven Spielberg. I'm not gonna regret this in a week. <laughs> no. It's completely acceptable for artists to have thematic preoccupations. In fact, it's practically necessary to be a true auteur who uses their medium to portray their view of the world, their politique, their artistic identity. I'm pretty sure someone said that directors just spend their entire lives making the same movie. Since Spielberg made his debut in Hollywood at 22, it took him a little bit longer to fully claim his title as an auteur. This is why in his early interviews he describes his films like Jaws as exercises in filmmaking. However, I think if you didn't want to go with that answer, I think you could rightfully say that Close Encounters of the Third Time is an excellent product of an auteur's vision. Though the logline is just Richard Dreyfuss finds aliens and they walk like this. But it also excellently communicates all of Spielberg's themey stuff. In Dreyfuss's Endless Search for Alien, you got his typical hunter versus gatherer conflict. The Captain Ahab, Ayn Rand, I don't know what it's um, expensive artist looking for their thing that they're obsessed with, and probably meeting it, touching it, and arriving at the synthesis of that dream. The artistic process. With how litty these glow up ice cream cones are, you also have his affinity for flight and how it represents freedom and the reclamation of innocence. 
he further depicts his classic Spielberg dynamic of the crying blonde mother, the absent father, and the lost child. The film additionally exemplifies Spielberg's theme of communicating transculturally with the other, finding personhood with something strange. Also, if you want an interview to make you cry, watch this child divorce who realized that in his wish former movie, where the central theme is a dream is what your heart makes from Pinocchio, When you wish upon a star to subtextually reunite his parents. Your father was a computer scientist. Your mother was a musician. When the spaceship lands, how do they communicate? That's they... a very good question. I like that. <laughs> You've answered the question. But thank you for that. However, I bring this to you with the benefit of hindsight, with the knowledge that Spielberg has three Best Director Oscars under his belt. So he's certainly a commercial filmmaker. He's a billionaire who made stuff like Transformers and Ready Player One. So his status as an auteur certainly remains controversial. Some even like to throw around the term anti-auteur. And depending on who you talk to, Spielberg's villain or hero origin story begins with his attempt to earn a photography merit badge. Rather than do the normal thing and take photos, he made a three minute western film. And when he showed the film to his Boy Scout troop a week later, he was greeted with cheers and whoops, and everything else that made him want it more and more. Spielberg describes his moment as the raw beginning, because while he would discover incredibly formative films like Pinocchio and Lawrence of Arabia when he was a teenager, actual filmmaking was what he first connected to. It became his escape from anxiety and a way to connect with the world that he thought would never accept him. In this artistic expression, he had a coping mechanism for the anti-Semitism he experienced in his community and the general bullying that comes with being unathletic and nerdy outsider in the 50s. Because suddenly, when he made films that people liked, he was no longer a monster, a forgotten dinosaur, or an alien. He could make what was strange, or foreign, or seemingly invasive, beautiful. Soon, Spielberg got really, really good at making movies that people whoop and cheer for. Though he was rejected from USC, he broke into Hollywood at 22, and after some work in TV and smaller films like Columbo, Duel, and Sugarland Express, when he was 26, Spielberg stopped making history, and he changed it. Because in 1978, we got Jaws. Suddenly, summer movies, recognizable IPs, wide cinema releases, and intense marketing campaigns were paramount to the movie making business. And Spielberg kept the hits coming. In 1981, he formed Amla Entertainment with Kathleen Kennedy and Frank Marshall, which gave us hits like The Goonies, Gremlins, and Balto. Oh, the shame of the polar bear who fears the water. No wonder we are shunned by our fellow bear. Woe is us. After you. Balto. <laughs> Big Paws kind of run in my family. Balls. Balls. In 1981 and 1982, this was kind of his flop era. You know, he made like, these really small indie flicks, E.T. and Indiana Jones. Now get ready for some quick E.T. fun fact blast because I really like this movie. Yeah. Number one. Before The Fablemans comes out this year in which Paul Dano is playing his father, E.T. remains one of his most personal films since when he was a kid, an alien was his imaginary friend. Number two, E.T. is one of the only movies Spielberg is genuinely happy with, and that's why there haven't been any more sequels. Number two done. Number three, when Spielberg was making E.T., he was also making Poltergeist. Poltergeist, dialectics. Number four, once my mom took me to see one of those live orchestral versions of E.T., and so they were also handing out like the, the M&M, the peanut M&M things that you could you could buy them in, and in the middle of the movie, you know, when he's like all sad and crying because E.T. is dying, I dropped every single one of them on the floor, and, and my friend and I were just laughing because every single one, it was so loud, and it was hor and it was really funny, but it was also horrible because it was number five. Isn't that the girl from the castle for Christmas? I had enough rambling about Amlin, moving on. Since joining Hollywood at 22, his narrative was that of a Peter Pan. Whenever Spielberg was asked about his process or his next steps, his response that he would wait until he was older and wiser. He made genre films or movies that glorified the magic of childhood. He liked happy endings. He was no Scorsese or Coppola or Kubrick. He was a commercial filmmaker. Whatever the equivalent of film Twitter was back then, 
was waiting for him to make a movie that was not covered in pixie dust. Stop making movies for the cheers and whoops of Boy Scouts. Despite the undeniable quality and cultural impact of his films, he was never perceived as a true auteur. In fact, you could easily argue that Spielberg and George Lucas killed the auteur. To steal from Bob Iger, movies no longer had an obligation to make art. Their only objective is to make money. So Spielberg's films could win Best Picture, but he never brought that golden baby boy home for himself. And Jaws is about to uh, be nominated in 11 categories. You're about to see us sweep the nominations. We're very confident. Get it. Oh, I didn't get it. I wasn't not. This is a very this is dark, a dark day. day for our pal. The greatest picture of all time was made, and they haven't recognized the, the director. director. Who made it? The shark? We're very confident. We're very confident. We're very confident. Who made it? The shark? And so it began Spielberg's self hate, self aware period. I'm still a piece of garbage. The shock! Spielberg started making serious movies. I, I no longer have that sense of adventure. I, there, there's a different kind of challenge in my life now that, that fascinates me more than just the fantasy adventure movie. I mean, no high concept genre films, no science fiction, no fantasy, no aliens, no guys with hats, whips, and or guns. There's only a man and a camera. In 1985, Spielberg adopted Alice Walker's The Color Purple. In 1987, Empire of the Sun. And if Jurassic Park didn't exist, I think you'd call this one the most cynical and self-reflexive Spielberg film. Oh. It follows a baby Christian Bale, an extremely annoying and privileged rich British child who is separated from his parents in the Japanese occupation of China. Like the typical Spielberg protagonist, he's also the obsessed artist because baby Bale loves Japanese fighter planes and like Pinocchio or Richard Dreyfus, his dream comes true. He touches what only existed as a sketched outline in his dreams at the cost of his family and his innocence. In an effort to make something imaginary real, his obsession turned into a monster. You know, kind of like how Spielberg just wanted to make a good movie and then he was responsible for the death of cinema. So flight is not freedom. Dreams come true, but at a cost, innocence is lost, and when Bale finally meets his parents, he can't recognize them. He can never go back. He spent too long focusing on whether he could. He never stopped to think of whether he should. Of the top ten money-making films of all time, you, you've made at least half. Do you ever feel that you, you're in danger of being remembered at a future date, not so much for the films, but for the money you make? Is, is, is that a fear of yours? Well, I think I've always worried about, about that. Um, but. Not to the exclusion that I would turn to myself and say, gee, I don't want to make any more successful pictures because I don't want to be remembered <laughs> for the money. I'm not, I'm not that naive. He wanted to make art, and he will forever be remembered as the man who made theme parks instead. Empire of the Sun is a refutation of innocence and dreams, and it was aptly Spielberg's dream movie that never really came true. He made David Lean's Lawrence of Arabia meets Gone with the Wind, but it remains today as one of the lowest grossing Spielberg movies. Clearly this was an anti-commercial film, but Spielberg was still snubbed for the Oscars. Maybe Hollywood would just never forgive him for what he did to the industry. Maybe Spielberg could never be an auteur. And then something bananas happened because in 1993 Spielberg released Schindler's List and he got the Best Director Oscar for it. Oh, and Jurassic Park also came out this year. Dialectics. But as one does after winning their Leo DiCaprio Oscar, Spielberg took three years off, founded DreamWorks Studios, and finally created Jurassic Park The Lost World, in which John Hammond, Spielberg's self-insert character, goes from a capitalist to a naturalist in three years. The character who Spielberg previously described as the critic is the hero of the story. Furthermore, as Spielberg explains, the first movie was really about the failure of technology and the success of nature. This movie is much more about the failure of people to find restraints within themselves, the failure of morality to protect themselves, and the failure of morality to protect these animals. He pauses, then laughs. I liken myself to the hunter that goes after the animals. They'll do anything for money, and so will we. So I suppose it's no surprise then that every Captain Ahab character and obsessive artist character and hunter gets the dinosaur chompy chomp. They have to be punished for their obsessive selfishness and their hubris. Because like Pinocchio before him, all of Steven Spielberg's dreams had come true. He won the Oscar, he became an auteur, and he could still make films that people cheered and paid for. He touched the stars and the dinosaurs and made monsters beautiful. And all it cost was his innocence. Do you know what Jurassic Park 3 has to say about that? Alan. I'm sorry, I just really want this to be the new Rick Roll. But seriously, what Jurassic Park 3 actually has to say about Steven Spielberg and the whole hunter deserves the dinosaur chompy chomp, well, well first, we gotta talk about the hat. 
I rescued your hat. Dr. Brand, we need to go now. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the important thing. this thing called French Immersion and of course I did that and that also meant that I've read The Little Prince by Saint Exupéry a lot. In outer space can catch a shooting star and sail away. Perhaps one day you come your way. Bonjour character who we'll later call the pilot exploring his dream of becoming a painter and you see this little kid he loves drawing boa constrictors but the adults around him are like that's not a boa constrictor that's a hat that is a hat that is clearly a hat so the nameless child decides to do something more practical and becomes a pilot he gives up on the boa constrictor and starts seeing the hat and then one day he crash lands in a desert and meets a little guy or a little prince and this little prince is really quite weird maybe he's real maybe it's a hallucination maybe it's a metaphor Woo. What's significant is that when the little prince and the pilot first meet, the little prince asks the pilot, the painter, to draw him a sheep. And while the only sheep he accepts is one that is non-literal, he represents the sheep to be hidden in a box, a sheep he can't see. Schrodinger's sheep. What's in the box? It's not mental illness if it's funny. And this continues throughout the rest of the story as the little prince keeps asking him to draw things, even with things he can't draw, because kids understand that the eyes are blind one must look with the heart. Jean Baudrillard had similar feelings about the importance of imagination and reality. He saw that cinema was becoming more realistic and reality was becoming more cinematic. We're living in a state of hyper-reality, a world that is realer than real. We live a life of symbols, representations. That's why for Yoda to seem real to us when he's done with CGI, his ears still have to wiggle like he's a puppet because our understanding of film language and our reality make what is fake feel more tangible. Cinema was clearly guilty of this. It had become hyper-realistic technically sophisticated, effective, performant. The films failed to incorporate any element of make-believe, the imaginaire. This guy held very strong feelings about this. I mean, he hated the Matrix, just because it tried to distinguish the world of reality and unreality even when there was a camera and, oh my gosh, the Matrix 4 would really blow the socks off this guy. And Steven Spielberg, with all his special effects and his turn to cinematic realism, was extremely complicit. Spielberg had finally stopped doing all that yucky yucky kid stuff. You know, saving Private Ryan's and endlessly sad children. That's why Spielberg represents a happy ending as Alan Grant except in the real world, seeing birds, normal birds, as fine and okay and beautiful just as they are. He embraces reality. But here lies the issue. There's still a camera between you and reality. It's all mimesis. It's all representation. It's F is for fake. It's tricks are for kids. And it's not mental illness of it's funny. What's weird though is that Baudrillard wasn't just a grouchy old guy. He was a huge film buff and thought that filmmakers like Jean-Luc Godard have managed to retrace through the image the insignificance of the world. That is to say, ultimately, innocence and to contribute to that insignificance with their images. Sometimes cinema, when wielded by the right person, could emphasize imagination rather than reality, make myth and not spectacle. Cinema and their directors could once again be innocent. I believe that Jurassic Park meaningfully does so because it's subverting the modern Spielberg themes and returns to the typical childlike ideas that Spielberg had to abandon in order to become an auteur before Spielberg grew up. There's the classic Spielberg family dynamic, lost children reunited with their practical father and blonde crying mothers, the reclamation of innocence. And hey look, in the last movie, he threw little raptor claw out to start to protect his found family and embrace reality. And this time he picks it back up, finding personhood and communicating transculturally with the other through art. Flight and helicopters mean freedom. And when Dr. Grant looks out the window this time, he sees a uh, fake dinosaurs. He doesn't abandon imagination, and the movie admits that the real world isn't all that real anyway. However, there is one typical Spielberg theme that GP3 does subvert. There is no Captain Ahab or Hunter vs. Gatherer narrative in this story. Alan. This next song honestly is not funny at all, but uh, it helps me sleep at night. Bo Burnham's Art is Dead is from his special Words, 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 but I came across this the first time in an episode of The Green Room where Ray Ramona asked him to perform the song. It's a bizarrely dissonant experience watching an audience laugh at a 20-year-old sing a very vulnerable song about his anxiety and how much he hates himself because <laughs> he made a funny face and it's a boy talking about makeup. 
My drugs attention, I am an addict, but I get paid to indulge in my habit. It's all an illusion. I'm wearing makeup, I'm wearing makeup, 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 makeup. Especially in comparison to the totally silent and vaguely uncomfortable faces of the other comedians. Because this song, it's not funny, not even in a dark way. It's more of a plea or the scream of guilt. Because Burnham's first special, in addition to being extremely problematic, is also one of his most nihilistic. To truly codify just how meaningless the world is, how much he doesn't care, how much nothing matters, he projects his entire script behind him throughout his performance. But as Burnham got older, he discovered something. He discovers that it's not the message, it's the mediums. Because of all that neoliberal consumer capitalism, I don't know why I used a Family Guy voice there. <laughs> Spielberg is just as self-aware as Bill Burnham, and made art that is just as cynical. However, it's unclear whether Marshall McLuhan's whole medium is the message thing really sunk in. The individual in, dare I say, neoliberalism, has always been central to his movies. The problem may be greed, but it is always the greed of an individual, not the exploitative nature of any system. The problem is John Hammond thought he could play God, or a greedy businessman did not want to close a beach. As a result, the solution is always the individual too. It's Francois Truffaut or Laura Dern. In fact, government regulation, unless it's an army, is often framed as something scary or bad. This also means that Spielberg himself really did kill cinema, not, you know, late-stage capitalism. And as Jean Bocher pointed out, maybe the medium of cinema itself is inherently dubious in destroying our ability to live lives that signify. I am an artist, I am an artist, but I'm just a kid, I'm just a kid, I'm just a kid, kid, and maybe I'll grow out of it. So what do you do if you love the medium of filmmaking and you make art for attention and profit? Does that mean that you deserve death by Dino Chomp Chomp? Well, GB3 says no, you don't deserve death by Dino Chomp Chomp. It says we need to collaborate and ask for help and be kind to ourselves. <laughs> that lame. It was the two sides of a coin that one obliterated me, one was my deepest fear, and one actually saved my life, which was I am not unique and I'm not alone. To demonstrate, let's make all the subtext text text. In the opening scene, Dr. Grant is an auteur filmmaker. You're still the best. The last of my breed. Auteur complaining about blockbusters. And it is in the rock that real auteur filmmaker make real discoveries. Now what John Spielberg? An InGen did at Jurassic Park is create genetically engineered theme park monsters. Nothing more and nothing less. Spielberg rediscovering his passion for movies. I read both of your movies. I like the first one more. Before you're on Hollywood. You liked movies back then. I made movies. On impulse, I thought they'd be worth a fortune enough to fund. The movies I want to make. For Ten more years. I have a theory that there are two kinds of boys. There are those that want to be astronomers and those that want to be filmmakers. The astronomer, paleontologist, gets to study these amazing things from a place of complete safety. But then you never get to make a movie. It's the difference between imagining and seeing, be able to touch them. That's Spielberg. what I wanted. Spielberg is not an astronomer. He loves a potentially destructive medium and loves making the imaginary reality. Because when he made movies that people liked, he no longer felt like a monster, a forgotten dinosaur, an alien, or a hunter in filmmaker's clothing. He could make what was strange, or foreign, or seemingly invasive, beautiful. As CJ the X demonstrates in The Kronk Effect, we may tell ourselves that we are auteurs, we make art for art's sake, or we make art to unite people, and raise awareness about an issue, but generally the central motivation is attention. We want to feel seen and loved and appreciated and smart. When sometimes when profit is seen as proof of our value, that we are accepted and loved and we feel that we belong, especially when money is, you know, necessary to live, we become hunters, even if it's no longer for survival. Jurassic Park 3 subverts our expectations of a modern Spielberg film and returns to his classic themes is a way of reminding us that we don't have to make art that is cynical, nor do we have to hate ourselves for doing so. There is nothing bad about you for making art. The art you make can be beautiful even if you're not doing it for purely altruistic reasons or to be an auteur. Since our mediums are inherently broken, we only really have two choices. To be kinder to ourselves or wait till we grow out of it. Steven Spielberg didn't. <laughs>
Bo Burnham certainly didn't, and neither did I. When I was younger, I wanted to be a scientist, and here I am, in this lovely box. But I'm sure I'll grow out of it, right, future Maddie? If you should travel to Africa someday, in the desert, I beg you not to hurry past. Wait. Wait a little, just under the star. Then if a child comes to you, if he laughs, if he has golden hair, if he doesn't answer your questions, <laughs> you'll know who he is. If this should happen, be kind. Don't let me go on being so sad. Send word immediately that he's come back. <laughs>